Hi everyone, um, very warm welcome to our energy transition panel discussion which forms part of Enterprise Ireland's newly launched Net Zero UK campaign. Uh, I'm Dara Cotter, I'm a Senior Market Advisor with Enterprise Ireland in our London office and I look after the areas of energy and clean tech. To those who might be unfamiliar, Enterprise Ireland is the trade and innovation agency of the Irish government and we work with over 5,000 Irish SMEs to help them start, grow, innovate and export globally. One of, Ireland, one of Enterprise Ireland's key remits is the sharing of relevant market insights with the Irish SME base to allow them to adapt their business strategies and R&D efforts accordingly. Our Net Zero UK campaign has been designed to ensure that Irish SMEs, particularly those with a strong presence in the UK market, are fully informed of the major policy, market and sectoral developments that are driving environmental and sustainability changes. As part of the campaign, today we take a closer look at the UK energy market and the implications for its net zero transition. It's also worth noting that we also have had sessions this week taking a closer look at construction, local authorities and, and the agriculture sector. So if you need any more details on any of those, please do feel free to get in touch with me. Happy to say we're joined today by three UK energy industry experts who will be on, who will be on hand to guide us. Uh, through what net zero energy actually means and help us to understand the impact on technology adoption, innovation, investment and supply chain requirements. Uh, we'll also take a look at some of the key challenges brought about by the net zero transition. Many thanks to Andrew Lever, uh, Kian McCleavy Revel and John Slow for taking the time to share their insights with us today. Um, I won't take any more of your time right now except to say that if you have any questions for the panellists, you can submit them via the questions tab on the sidebar of GoToWebinar. Uh, and we'll do our best to relay these during our discussion. Just a quick note, uh, John is with us. He can hear us and we can hear him. Um, we're having some slight audio uh, difficulty with, with John. Oh, right on cue. There we go. Hi, John. Great. Um, that's, a, that's a perfectly apt way to get our um, introductions kicked off. Um, so, Andy, uh, we might start with you, if that's okay. Would you mind just giving us a brief introduction to the, to the Carbon Trust and, and the role that you play there? Please. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dara. Yeah, and good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you for the for the invite to to share some thoughts uh, today. So yeah, I Andy Lever. I'm a director uh, in the Carbon Trust. Um, for those of you who, who don't know the Carbon Trust, we are a kind of mission driven organisation. Um, that mission is to accelerate the move to a sustainable, uh, low carbon uh, economy. Uh, so what that means in practice is that we, we partner with businesses, um, organisations and governments, um, not just in the, in the UK, but around the world um, and help them um, kind of lead the way to that kind of sustainable future. That includes setting strategy, um, undertaking footprinting work and target setting um, to uh, reduce uh, carbon emissions in, in their business organisation or at a policy level. Um, so that includes business model innovation, uh, climate action plans, um, and yeah, we we have a, a, a over 200 people in the organisation who are based both here in the UK um, as well as um, in Latin America, South Africa, um, Southeast Asia, um, China, and and the US. Uh, a bit about myself: um, I've been with the organisation um, for six years now. I I was with Eon, who are a uh, utility, um, uh, so very much come from a kind of energy background. Uh, at the Carbon Trust, I lead up our energy systems team, which is really associated um, with all things to do with the energy transition, um, be it through um, uh, greater renewable penetration, integration of that renewables, um, grid development, local energy systems, smart metering, um, flexibility, energy and, and, and storage. So. And very much uh, kind of innovative look at how these new approaches and technologies can help us get to, to kind of net zero and going forward. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Andy. That's great. Um, John, if it's okay, uh, now that we can hear you and see you, um, I go to you next and learn a bit more about yourself and uh, and Delta EE, please. Sure. Thanks, Tara. So, hello, everyone. Um, I was one of the three people set up Delta EE uh, a while quite a while ago, 2005. Like Andy described, we have a, a similar mission, which is to help the energy sector to navigate the energy transition as, as quickly, as successfully and as fairly as, as possible. The way we do that is we carry out research 
on exactly how the energy transition is unfolding across the UK, across Europe and beyond. Um, we generally look at it from the customer end of the value chain. Um, so looking at customer propositions, but as many of you will know, you can't divide up the energy value chain these days into customers, networks, generation. It's all very interconnected. So we, we look at the whole value chain. Um, we also carry out consulting work as well as uh, research. And our clients typically are energy companies in all their different forms and technology companies, product technology companies, product manufacturers, ranging from startups in Ireland and beyond through to big companies like Schneider, uh, Siemens, and so on. Brilliant. Thank you, John. Uh, last but not least, Kian, would you mind introducing uh, the National Grid ESO and, and the role that you play there, please? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so, yeah, my name is Kian McLeary Rebel. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so, I head up a strategy team in National Grid ESO that's focused on kind of long term direction and and reform of all the electricity markets in GB um, to, to get to net zero. And I'll, I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. Um, I've been in this particular role for six months. Prior to that, I spent four years in the ESO innovation team. Um, before that, I spent five years at EDF Energy, so another uh, big utility in, in the UK across corporate and retail strategy teams. And my first job was actually working for John at Delta. So uh, yeah. last from the past there. Uh, so National Grid ESO, so ESO stands for Electricity System Operator. Um, we are a, a, a kind of a, a smaller subsidiary, uh, now legally separate from the wider um, National Grid group. And our job is to, in, in a sentence, keep the lights on. Um, so we, we operate the system, that means we balance supply and demand in real time, and we ensure a safe and secure transmission system. So we make sure that electricity gets to where it needs to be and when it's, when it's needed. The equivalent in, in Ireland is, is, is AirGrid, and however we're, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're a separate system operator from transmission owner, and that's largely due to the kind of extended role that we play, not just in balancing the system, but also in advising government and our regulator off gem as to where long-term investment needs to happen on the system, um, and we also develop long-term future energy scenarios that the industry then uses to, uh, to support their, their investment. Um, so at ESO, we, we run a number of, of markets and the, 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 I guess the key, the key market for electricity in, the, in Great Britain, which we don't operate, is the wholesale market. Uh, so that's where the vast majority, so about 90%, 95% of electricity is traded between generators and suppliers and it kind of balances itself. We then operate at the, the kind of residual last two hours of that where we will spend in a normal year, about half a billion pounds a year to bid on generation, bid off demand, or vice versa, to make sure that supply and demand is balanced, because as we all know, uh, electricity is, is, is not 100% predictable. Um, and as we get more and more variable renewables and more and more kind of complex demand on the system, that predictability is getting uh, less and less. So balancing the system becomes an increasing challenge as we, as we transition to net zero. We also run another uh, it's kind of set of what we call ancillary services markets, and they kind of range from what we would call constraints, where there's not enough transmission capacity to get electricity from where it's generated to where it's needed. Uh, so we need to effectively reroute power through different parts of the system, which usually means turning things off in Scotland and turning things on in England. There's a few more kind of technical markets that we run to support system frequency, voltage stability, which I, I won't go into. Um, and we also hold a number of insurance policies. So if something bad happens, like we lose an interconnector to France or one of the nuclear units trips off, we need to have insurance policies in the background, basically um, kind of, uh, power stations or capacity in reserve that are able to come on and, and replace that lost, that lost load. So our markets run alongside the wholesale market, which I've already spoken about, but also a number of kind of government-led um, incentives, policies, instruments that will facilitate the investment required in zero carbon generation to get us to net zero, and also for system security purposes, like um, making sure that there's enough capacity on the system for times of system stress. 
And all of these markets were designed anywhere between 10 and 20 years ago, and they were designed for a specific purpose. And arguably, you know, they've, they've served us pretty well uh, to get us to where we are now. But if we were to get to the hugely difficult and ambitious targets of uh, both Carbon Budget 6, which is in 2035, where pretty much the power sector needs to be decarbonized, but also net zero, these markets, we think, need to be fundamentally reformed. They operate kind of in isolation at the minute. Um, a lot of the kind of government-led or wholesale markets don't necessarily have operability in mind when they when they were designed and vice versa. So my team's job is to work with government and the regulator to figure out how, how bad things might get in, in the near to medium to long-term future and therefore what reforms we need to start implementing over the next few years to get us to net zero. Great, so, thanks. That's a, a really good yeah, perfect. And that's a um, really comprehensive overview of, of National Grid ESO. And, and I think we'll come back to the later in the discussion around the importance of balancing supply and demand. Um, but I think it's fair to say you've got a, you've got your hands full over the coming years. Um, so I, I think look, the first thing, and I think possibly the most important thing at the outset to do is to define really what the energy transition actually means and what net zero energy will ultimately look like. Um, just so we can, as a group here today, just have a common understanding that we can um, go to the rest of the questions with. Um, Andy, if, if I could go to you first, maybe. Um, I think many listening will know about growth in the renewable energy sector and understand broadly that a transition means replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy. Um, but, you know, as we know, that there's many other facets to the energy transition. What do you think? is meant by the term energy transition and, and what does it mean for the UK in, in practice over the coming years, do you think? Yeah, um, you know, thanks Tara. I mean, I guess I guess the word transition suggests that you're you're moving from from where we are today to some to something that's that's, that's different, of course. Um, so I guess the way I think about this is the uh, the UK government has kind of signed up to its its net zero target by by 2050. That's a kind of legally legal obligation now, um, and legally binding, um, and therefore uh, and a lot and a lot of effort has been done, of course, in decarbonising the power sector. And it's in it, you know, globally, it's one of the sectors that is 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 the largest emitting. Um, and there has been some way to go, or there has been some you know fantastic progress to shift into renewables and reduce you know, our reliance upon you know, fossil fuels, of course. Um, but that, that, of course, doesn't get us to that net, that net zero target, um, unfortunately. So um, that means that we have to look beyond the power sector, and we, we, we all know that, and uh, and look at the how we heat our homes, how we heat our businesses, um, how we power our industry, uh, how we, we, we travel, and how, how transport um, uh, you know, we we take carbon out of out of vehicles, etc., and rail. So, when you look at that and and you broaden out that 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 whole kind of cross sector um, uh, picture, then you know a, a number of things have to happen. Um, and therefore, I think uh, you know how we hit our homes changes, how we 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 travel, how we how we drive our cars, and and the types of vehicles we will have. Um, you know, the, the, these will all be changing, and, and I think the the transition, therefore, is 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 transitioning from, um, uh, you know, the a fossil based um, economy and um, and way of way you know day to day way of life into 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 something which is which is very much uh, low to low to zero carbon. Um, so uh, I think yeah, transition is 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 transitioning in a true sense of the word, and and, and changing the way that we that, that we do things. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. John, John, would you have anything to add to Andy's uh, summary there about what the transition actually means? Yeah, just building on that, I guess, as Andy said, generation is decarbonizing. Everyone can see that through through wind, onshore, offshore wind, solar. Keen, you'll probably uh, disagree with me, but in a way, I think generate, decarbonizing generation is the easy part or there's a clear pathway for that. Um, Decarbonising transport, people can envisage with electric vehicles, maybe hydrogen for, for heavy goods vehicles. Um, Decarbonising heat uh, is 
I think the biggest challenge out of the three. So heat in buildings, industri industrial heat, as Andy said. So I think of it in those three chunks. Um, I think of it in terms of the energy system, how all this knits together, how networks keep working, the things Kian talked about. And I think of it in terms of customers, how does this work for customers? As a customer, what what propositions can people offer me? How do I switch my heating system? How do I integrate my solar panel with my electric vehicle? Um, and the one thing we haven't mentioned yet is energy efficiency, which is critical because the less demand we have, the less of a challenge that we have. So Absolutely. probably those three blocks, transport, heat generation, yeah. energy system and customers, and energy efficiency. Great, John. Uh, Kim, would you agree with that, that decarbonization and generation is the easy part and that's where we're looking <laughs> at part of the decarbonized areas like so is where the real challenge lies. Do you have anything else to say broadly? Um, about the energy transition and um, in practice what you know what would come out of that yeah I think um, I mean I whether I, I, the, easy is probably not the word I, I would I would use um, but it certainly has been the low-hanging fruit so far and I totally agree with John that heat is the killer it's the killer app in in this in this problem um, you know, how do you how do you persuade particularly consumers to to get rid of their their lovely, well working, well functioning gas boilers and replace them with mm. a pretty expensive bit of complicated kit that doesn't offer them any better service, arguably. Um, and it's you know for something as fundamentally you know important to well being as, as as heat is, and particularly in you know the UK or in, in Ireland where it gets pretty cold. Um, I, I, so I, I, I agree with everything that's been been said so far. I think you know the the, the transition, the energy transition, will ultimately boil down to to uh, decarbonizing the power sector, transport and heat, and and transport and heat will ultimately have a huge impact on the power sector. Um, you know, if you, I think, you know, there's hydrogen. I'm sure is going to come up at some point in this discussion, but. The direction of travel is large-scale electrification of of heat and transport. That is going to hugely increase the, the the demand for zero carbon electricity. So our Fez, our future energy scenarios, which you can you can find uh, online, you know they 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 look at f four different outcomes, but ultimately we're looking at at least a doubling, if not a tripling, of electricity generation capacity by 2050. Um, so that's not only a huge investment challenge. Uh, the, you know the numbers can be quite eye-watering when, when you when you add them all up um, but it's uh, all the infrastructure that needs to go along with that um, transmission and particularly distribution capacity that uh, needs to be increased to allow all of these uh, you know sexy new low carbon technologies to connect to the system and operate um, but also as John said consumer behavior needs to kind of uh, be, be closely looked at and needs to completely change uh, all the underlying um, digital and data technologies that will facilitate all of this and again I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to that in a, in a lot more detail later. I think we're probably lucky in, in the UK that decarbonisation and climate change is, is a bipartisan issue, you know, this cross-government support for, um, that, that, you know, it's a climate emergency and we need to do something about it. However, the, let the scale of investment required and what that is going to mean for consumers' bills uh, can't be ignored and uh, I think we just need to make sure that we decarbonize and electrify the system in a way that is a most value to consumers and that is not an easy uh, problem to solve and we want to avoid any kind of climate wars happening in in the UK as, as we've seen in other uh, in other economies so, so look, it's a, it's a it's a big challenge, um, and you mentioned uh, electricity demand how it could double or even triple by 2050. I think in the the energy white paper published by the government last December, I think they they said uh, demand electricity demand could double by 2050. Potentially, as you say, it might go over that. Um, so just in terms of you know acknowledging the fact that it is a big challenge, it's going to require a lot of um, investment, um, a lot of um, a lot of adoption of, of low carbon technologies that, that some of them are on the market others are uh, coming to market um in terms of how the uk government is addressing the challenge and, and 
I think we've seen some recently, you know, recently we've seen some high level energy policy developments announced by the government. Uh, the white paper I mentioned uh, was published last December, the energy white paper that kind of sets out how the UK will, will clean up its energy system and re reach net zero emissions by 2050. Um, last November, we also saw the UK's UK government's 10-point plan for a, a green industrial revolution. Uh, that's you know, greater, that identifying greater support for, for areas like offshore wind or um, accelerating the adoption of, of electric vehicles, implementing energy measures to deliver greener buildings, things of this nature. So I guess the, the question, uh, keeping that in mind, is um, whether the UK government, uh, if the ambition is realistic um, or ambitious enough, do you think that the policy framework is, is, is in place just yet to actually facilitate that transition? Um, I guess I better address that to, to someone. Um, Andy, I might uh, pick on you first. <laughs> um, question, um, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no. It, it, it's, it's ambitious enough. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the government's ten-point plan um, covers all areas that we've actually just touched upon in terms of, off, you know, more offshore wind, um, focusing on hydrogen, um, shifting to electric vehicles or or zero emission vehicles, um, thinking about how, how buildings and how you know how we heat our homes, as we've already touched on. So, so, so certainly in terms of you know what what are the types of um, uh, areas that we need to address, it, it, has, it has that coverage. Um, so it's certainly re realistic in that in that sense. Is it ambitious? Um, I think if you take offshore wind, for example, 40 gigawatts by 2030 feels pretty punchy and pretty ambitious. Um, some of our own analysis we, we, we completed in our own report on 2050 suggests we need 120 gigawatts by 2050. So, you know, I think uh, that is um, doing another 40 gigawatts by 2040 and another 40 gigawatts by, by, by 2050. So, uh, you know, it, it is a sustained investment requirement, not just to 2030, but also to or 2035, but, but over the next, the next uh, three, three decades. Uh, I think the only, I mean, uh, as, as, uh, I'll, I'll let John and, and, and Keen come in, of course. But in terms of uh, policy legislation that we're still waiting on, um, there's still the heat and um, buildings strategy to to emerge. There's still the hydrogen strategy to emerge, and there um, there's an update to the smart systems and flexibility plan as well, which which is which is imminent. So uh, I'm hoping that we'll see a bit more direction in detail um, through through those. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we could we could pick up any of those ten points, but uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's uh, it, it's it's a case of kind of um, get, 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 getting on getting on with that now. Um, and um, uh, yeah, we, I could I could go on, but maybe maybe I'll stop there and let the other guys come. I, I, I think you've actually answered my next question in in that answer. <laughs> as well. The next question was. What are the next kind of policy um, or legislative developments that we're like likely to see um, with regard to energy transition? You mentioned things like the heating and building strategy. Um, John, is there anything else that you know everyone listening on the call? Primarily, there, there'll be Irish SMEs working in the UK energy sector. Yeah. Are there other policy developments relevant to the transition that they should be aware of and, and keeping in mind and, and likely to impact on on how they do business? Do you think? There are a ton of them, Dara. Um, so when I look at the need to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, I think no, the UK is not doing enough. It needs to do more. It needs to go faster. It needs to lead by. It needs to be lead globally, uh, lead by example. Um, but if I look at it another way, how does UK compare to other European countries? I think that bipartisan support that Kian said talked about there's a huge amount that the UK is doing and I think it's it's ahead of other countries in a number of different ways so there is real momentum I think being built uh, there's always more that needs to be done you could always argue things need to be done faster um, the bit that's neglected I would say is probably probably heat so far I think the UK has wasted a decade pretty much on really pushing for decarbonisation of heat, but that's 
that's coming into focus now. Um, it's politically the hardest part to do. The other part yeah. that I would say is really hard is the building of what Keen said and that that need to we have an energy electricity system and energy system that's built still being designed for yesterday's energy system with you know 70 big power plants around the country in 2030 we'll have millions and millions of power plants around the country you know in people's homes in people's buildings we'll have electric vehicles that uh, absorb energy from the grid that even put power back onto the grid so the two big areas i would say there'll be a ton of movement on that have, hasn't been so much today would have been heat and that elect, electricity or energy system design and how all that links together yeah great thanks john andy or sorry kian anything to add to andy and, and john's points there or are they they captured it are we, are we looking at heat um as the area with the with the furthest to go at present yeah, I, I I think so. I I think he again is 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 top of the top of the list of of challenges, and uh, I guess coupled with energy efficiency because they they go hand in hand. Um, I, I think are going to be the the toughest problems to to solve. Um, but yeah, totally agree with everything that's been said. I, I think just echoing Andy. I think the devil's in the detail on on a lot of these plans. Um, you know, top line ambitions are are great, but it's how how they'll be implemented, how they'll particularly be integrated. And that's touching on John's kind of smart system uh, comments as well. Um, the, the the challenge there is 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 absolutely enormous. Um, you know, how do we get those 40 gigs in 2030 of offshore wind actually onshore? Um, how are all those offshore systems coordinated, and uh, how do we maximise the value of investment there as well? Um, just yeah, an, an awful lot to to unpick when it comes yeah. to actually those ambitions. That probably brings us neatly on to the, to the next uh, topic and, and question, and that is around the, the changes basically that are, are going to be required for the grid um, and you know how, how the grid is, is going to be able to cope and it's going to integrate um, larger much larger degree of um, renewables, how as John alluded to, how it's going to you know accommodate for example, electric, uh, electric vehicles um, putting power back onto the grid and having a much more decentralized energy system. Um, from a national grid point of view, um, okay, and these, these are obviously quite large challenges. Um, how do you think the national grid, um, particularly the ESO, will, will address those? Um, is it a question of, of investment and building out the infrastructure? Is it a question of working with uh, SMEs that might have the technology and the smart grid technology, smart energy technology that, that you need to handle that transition or handle that that increased uh, renewables load? There's probably about four questions in, in one there, so uh, take your pick. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I, I think, um, th I mean, there's uh, a, a, an ever-growing list of challenges that, that we as, as the ESO face in, in uh, in getting to where we need to get to, to to make sure that we can operate the system at, at 100% uh, zero carbon, and we actually have a, a, a published ambition that we can't hide away from uh, to be able to operate 100% uh, zero carbon generation system by 2025. Um, so some some of the key challenges to to getting there. Um, the first, well, where do I start? <laughs> One issue is, is system stability, and I, I won't go into the, the, the kind of technical details of what that means. But um, ultimately, uh, you know, in terms of balancing supply and demand, it's uh, we need to keep that very finely tuned. And the old system that John talked about, these 70 big fossil generation um, spinning units, used to provide a lot of inherent stability, almost acting as a kind of a counterbalance to the system in, in case of any events occurring. As all those plants retire, we, we, we have less and less inherent stability in the system, which means that we either need to top it up with other stuff that provides the same stability, or we need to act a lot smarter and a lot faster and respond much quicker to, to events. So there's a, a lot going on um, in, in ESO on both of those. Um, constraints is, is, a, is another one that I'll, I'll just pick up on, and, and that's, that comes back to the, the point I made earlier about, um, you know, if there's just not enough 
pipes to get wind from Scotland down to where it needs to be consumed in England, uh, then we, unfortunately, we need to pay wind to turn off, and this is wind that's already been paid to generate, and we need to turn up fossil generation in England to, to, to make up the balance. Um, we currently spend about, uh, about four or 500 million on, on, on this a year. Um, so it's already pretty, pretty eye-watering sums. We published a paper last week um, that, that kind of shows that under the current market mechanisms, that's going to increase to over two and a half billion a year by 2027, so towards the back end of this decade. Um, and that's largely because the build out of transmission just isn't keeping pace with the build out of renewables. So lots of, lots of work going on across ESO as to how we manage those costs and bring those down uh, over the next few years. But ultimately, we need to really start thinking about how markets deliver the right locational signals for for um, generation to 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 invest? So, you know, the question is, should we be building all this wind in Scotland um, to to send it down to England if we, if we also need to build out huge amounts of transmission capacity? So that's some of the work that we'll we'll be looking at. I think another key issue for us, and and uh, John mentioned, you know, the, the transition from 70 big transmission connected power stations to millions of of, of small distributed energy assets. So the, the increase in distributed generation and electrification of heat and transport means that there's a huge increase in the activity on the distribution network. So we operate the high voltage transmission system. There's uh, 14 different distribution regions in, in Great Britain, uh, operated by six different companies. Those distribution network operators traditionally act quite passively and they, they just make sure that there's enough pipes to, to be able to um, kind of deliver the power that's needed to consumers. Given all of this kind of new complex behavior and increased power flows, they need to, be, they need to become much more active. They need to manage their own networks as, if we, as, as we manage the, the higher voltage system. Um, but that has a huge impact on our system as well. So we need to work together in a, in a in much more of a kind of a coordinated and co-optimized manner. And that's very new to uh, to the distribution guys and it's new to us to be able to, to work with, with those guys in, in that way and actually we've got at the moment little to no visibility of what's happening on their on their system which also has a knock-on impact on us there's millions and millions as John said of data points that we just don't have access to um, even if we did we're a pretty big old-school company you know we're, we're a data-driven company but our systems are uh, you know from a from a different age we're, we're, we're rapidly investing in in new systems um, and new capabilities machine learning data science um, but there's a huge amount of work to be done there so all yeah. of these different elements in terms of i think data and digital is the is, is probably the biggest opportunity for supply chain companies at the moment um, and not just for big old utilities like us and upgrading our systems but enabling all of this cool stuff to happen in consumers homes on the distribution network and across the grid um, and then obviously all of the different new technologies, so the, the, the new tech that is able to provide us with stability services, um, flexibility technologies across the whole system, um, and, and, and all of the platforms and software that will help to uh, help those things to operate and, and integrate into the system. Yeah. Yeah. Tons right. of things. Tons of Absolutely. Uh, John, you know, from your perspective, um, I know you work with uh, a wide variety of, of companies in, in, mm. in Delta E. Where in the value chain do you think we're likely to see uh, most innovation coming from and, and what capability is likely to be in demand in the coming years? Kian mentioned there things like uh, data science and machine learning and the national grid are, are investing heavily in those areas. Um, are there other um, strengths or capability that are, that are going to be in high demand to, to facilitate this transition? Yeah, so there's still a ton of hardware or traditional kit that's going to be needed. And you can look at everything from offshore wind to repurposing gas networks to be able to transport hydrogen uh, to transformers and uh, widgets and gadgets for distribution networks. So there's a ton of hardware, but I think the big change is that is in software uh, and bringing together the data, the uh, machine learning, the artificial intelligence that, that Kian talked about. So 
in some cases that software will be packaged with hardware. So if you're a distribution network company, you need a transformer that can automatically adjust voltage settings. So if everyone's taking power off the grid to charge their electric vehicles, the transformer can automatically adjust its settings. And that needs to have uh, captured data from sensors on the network. For, it needs to know that customers are charging their electric vehicles. So I think there's a huge need for innovation in software sometimes on its own, sometimes with hardware. A lot of that around the flexibility topic Kian talked about. Um, and the other aspect of the supply chain I think is neglected uh, is, is customers and uh, things like behavioral science, behavioral economics. Uh, I don't know if Ireland's got a particular strength in that area. Uh, I'm, I know it has it around data, but bringing together that data with people that really understand how to package things up for customers. So yeah. the four of us probably don't know, we know roughly how much we spend on our electricity bill a year. We don't know what that's made up of because, uh, but as we have smart meters, then we have the ability to understand, okay, this is how it's made up. And if I put a solar panel on my roof, this wouldn't save me on average 400 pounds a year, it would save me uh, 576 pounds a year because I know exactly how much I consume. So yeah, I think there's so much innovation needed in the supply chain around data and everything that goes around that. Yeah, uh, Andy, do you have any, any thoughts on that in terms of, um smart solutions, digitalization that, that, that will be required to, to fuel this transition. Um, anything to add? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think the guys have covered it, covered all the, the, the main points. I mean, uh, it, it does come down to, uh, a lot of it does require digitalization. Um, and, uh, you know, we should think about ourselves, even our own homes as, as playing a larger part now in the energy system. Um, you know, some of our work um, suggests you know, that there's a real low-hanging fruit, fruit around um, flexibility being provided from electric vehicles. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, quite quite substantial and, and as, a, as a demand side response measure. So um, how you coordinate what will now, you know, be turning into kind of millions of vehicles with, with government targets um, to Take into consideration people's journeys, you know how they how they use their their, their vehicle, um, how big the car, but the battery is, um, how that responds to signals from from the local energy market and the, the DNO through to the to the national um, system operator. Um, all of all of these data points are and and the business models fundamentally. Um, we need to work all that out and and make that compelling for for consumers as well um, to to engage. So. I think, yeah, I think a lot of this um, flexibility that's, that's been discussed sits at the distributed and a local level, which means that consumers and likes of you and I have to get more, much more engaged. And, and I think, you know, that's where a lot of the focus um, inevitably will be. And, and indeed, you know, as we talked about heat decarbonisation as well, um, we also have to deal with that from a from a from a consumer level, and um, so there's a, there's a number of things happening, you know, within our own um, spheres of influence that 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 we need to we need to now, now deal with, and uh, yeah, uh, innovation around that space is uh, we certainly haven't cracked it yet, so there's lots to do. Yeah. I, I think um, we might actually just go back to to the topic of of heat, and I think John, you mentioned earlier that it's a politically sensitive um, issue. Um, a question has actually come through on, on the chat here, uh, asking uh, where does decarbonisation of, of natural of the natural gas grid and using uh, you know currently the natural natural gas grid is used as a backup to uh, intermittent renewables. Um, where does where does that fit into the net zero uh, transition? So so how are we going to use the or repurpose the the national gas grid and um, Obviously, that's going to have knock-on effects again in terms of um, how people heat their homes, in terms of uh, gas boilers and potentially gas boilers becoming obsolete or phased out in the UK. How big of an issue um, is that, and and what will actually happen with the natural 
natural gas grid. Um, Kian, do you have do you thoughts on, on that one? I know it's a, it's a weighty issue, but i um, interested to hear if you, you have a, an opinion on, on what will actually happen with the natural, with the, with the gas grids. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, so it, it, it is, it's a, it's a big question and certainly one that my, um, I'm sure my, well, now that National Grid are divesting a majority share in, in their gas transmission business, maybe not one that my CEO is as worried about as he was last year. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a big question. You know, these are hugely, um, expensive assets that uh, have a long lifetime left. And the, you know, the gas transmission business here and, and of course, this gas distribution businesses as well are all um, trying to figure out if, you know, if it can be repurposed, used for used for hydrogen. And there's lots of um, big innovation projects, big expensive uh, trials that are being run to, to figure out if, if, if that's a goer. And, um, you know, it's not my area of expertise, but I think, you know, there, there will be a place for, for hydrogen. Um, how it's transported, stored, and and, and used uh, is is up for debate. Um, but yeah, it's um, there's there's certainly life in the gas gr gas grid yet, um, and a, and a lot of uh, of work and research and development and trials across all the different um, kind of angles of the supply chain for hydrogen to be to be undertaken before we we, we find out exactly yeah. what the future of that like. John, if I, if I just go to you next with, with that very same question in terms of you know how you, how do you see the the natural gas uh, system and, and the grid um, evolving in the coming years? Yeah, so there was about ten years ago the government strategy was well actually we won't need the gas grid because we'll decarbonise power and then we'll switch all the heating over to electric heating mostly via heat pumps. Um, I think now there's a realization that that's a bit simplistic and on the cold winter days where there's a huge heating demand and it's uh, an order, you know, it's several times bigger than peak electricity demand, peak heat demand, um, that we can't rely on meeting all that peak heat demand solely through electricity. So I think there will be a role for the gas grid. I think we will rely less on gas, so electric heat will be more electrified, but we'll see a lot of hybrid systems, so uh, homes using electricity for heating for the most part, but gas for the heating on the coldest days, for example. But that can't be natural gas if we're to hit on net zero targets, so that's where hydrogen comes in. I think it's too simplistic to either think of electrifying heat completely and no role for gas, and it's also too simplistic to think we'll just swap out natural gas for hydrogen and flick a switch and we'll be using hydrogen in exactly the same way as natural gas. So the answer is some way in the middle. It will be a lesser role for gas, but I still believe there will be a role for gas. Maybe not in every every home or building that there is today, but there'll still be a significant role for gas in the form of uh, a low carbon gas such as hydrogen. Great, thanks John. I think that again brings us on to the topic of hydrogen that you've mentioned there um, and the role that that will play in, in terms of uh, helping to decarbonize those kind of hard to hard to abate sectors and and um, I, guess, I guess I'd be interested um, getting your perspective on how promising a technology uh, hydrogen is and and you know particularly over the next decade how realistic is it as a, as a large scale um, opportunity uh, and technology. Um, any volunteers to, to tackle that big question at, at the outset? I think I think Dara, yes, it's, it's a good question, um, and I think there's a lot of debate around how you generate that hydrogen as well. Um, is it electrolysis or is it CCS? Um, and uh, I think the answer is it's a bit of both. Um, the hydrogen to get to net zero we will need hydrogen i think is it's fair to say um that that hydrogen is used sparingly pro probably because it's used in the hard to treat sectors the the industry processes the you know manufacturing 
um, certain certain sectors, subsectors within within transport, um, and you know e even you know globally, it's it's one of those vectors I think that will solve some 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 issues um, where uh, you know there is no credible um, alternative. So I think um, it's less about uh, you know back backing a particular technology. I mean I, I don't think. We we have the um, we we couldn't build enough generation to to fuel um, to make hydrogen three electrolyzers completely. Um, but but CCS, whilst cost effect more, perhaps more cost effective, um, hasn't really been proven at scale yet, um, and has you know. But so so that as as is always, there's no silver bullet to some of these um, the, the, these technologies. Um, and again, you know, it's coming coming back to the government's ten point plan, which identified that um, in terms of innovation, uh, there, there really is uh, a, a good strong need to focus in on cost reduction and performance improvement in those areas. We've we've seen a few uh, development of industrial clusters in the UK, um, where you know you you're you're looking at more of a, a local solution where there is heavy industry or the infrastructure to, to support like the CCS or or, or, or offshore wind infrastructure, bringing that power onto the onto the mainland. So, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's expensive. It's it, it's expensive to make. So you need to really think about carefully where you where you use it. And I think that's the that's that's the critical part. So it's not necessarily about the cost. It's actually where does it fit within the wider system, and where is it where is it the most cost effective place to to consume it as well. Sure. John, John, where do you think hydrogen is in terms of large scale deployment? Um, what kind of time scales are we realistically looking at here for for, for wide widespread adoption of, of hydrogen? So widespread adoption in the UK, it won't be in this decade. Um, but it, it might be uh, it might be adopted more widely in the next decade. So just to explain that in a bit more detail. That doesn't mean there won't be any adoption this decade. There will be, and there'll be increasing amounts. But to put the scale into context, we just looked at the um, the pipeline for green hydrogen. So that's from electrolysis across yeah. Europe uh, through to 2025. And it's just a few gigawatts. The European target is six gigawatts. There needs to be quite a lot more projects come into that pipeline to reach that six gigawatts. And that's across all of Europe. Uh, and the UK is not one of the top three in Europe in that pipeline. So we'll be producing clean hydrogen, but it will be small amounts. And that will go to, as, as Andy said, it will go to uh, refineries. It will go to industrial processes where you need high temperature heat. You need to burn something to get that, that high temperature heat. Um, it might go to hydrogen buses or heavy goods vehicles where electrification might be a bit harder. But we're not going to be swimming in green, cheap hydrogen in this decade, possibly in future decades, but um, it's it's a real embryonic industry today. Great. OK, thanks. Um, I think I'm, I'm slightly conscious of the time. Um, it's, it's ticking away. We're having a very good discussion here. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, I guess one of the final questions I might put to you is 2030, I know 2050 is, the, is when the UK is aiming for, for net zero. Uh, 2030, I think, is, is largely accepted as the first big milestone in that, in that journey. Uh, that's just nine years away, uh, so not very long at all. Um, what do you think the supply chain, the energy supply chain, should be thinking most about now over that over the next nine years. Um, what should they be factoring into their planning and strategies right now? Do you think where again where 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 do we see the biggest change coming um, in in those nine in that nine year time frame up to twenty thirty? Um, and the um, do you have any any thoughts on that? It's a it's a bit of a yeah. curveball to end with. Yeah, but, no, no, um, no, no, no. I think um, no, it's, it's a good question. And you know, we we often think you know, 2050 is three three decades away. Um, I think there's three areas, and we've touched on them to a greater or lesser extent just now. Um, the one is infrastructure. The grid will need 
build out to accommodate increased electrification. Um, second one would be around heat, then be that around heat pumps, be it around district heating, be it around thermal storage. Um, we we just need to crack on with that. You know, we need to. The, the, the numbers are phenomenal when you look at the, the amount of annual build out that we need um, starting from now. Um, and I think the third one is around smartness. And um, I think that we've touched, we we're moving into a, 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 a system that needs more smartness and flexibility. So the, be that around data, be it around digitalization, software, customer propositions, um, uh, you know, linking in with the markets that Kean talked about right at the start. All of these things need, if we're to do this efficiently and cost effectively, then that that that, that smartness and that software data aspect help, helps greatly um, to to do it without, um, yeah, in the most the most cost effective way. So those those would be the three areas I think that we can that are just no regrets that we will need to crack on and get 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 sorted. Brilliant. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Kian, same same question, and perhaps um, you might have two or three. Um, priorities that, that you think are two, two or three areas of, that are going to dominate between now and 2030. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, so. We, I mean, our, our, our future energy scenarios, um, and this from last year, we'll be, we'll be republishing in, in July. But the, the three scenarios that achieve net zero, I think they all see hydrogen and CCS uh, on the system at the back end of this decade. So by 2030, um, you know, to, to get there in, in that short number of years, there's an awful lot to be done, um, and supply chains need to be built in, in, in those technologies. And obviously, storage. I think we're looking at tenfold growth in in, in storage capacity, um, largely from, from battery storage. Uh, you know, out to, out to 2050. I think on on the cons on the flexibility and particularly the consumer point. Um, so there's. There's a, there's a wide spectrum of opinions as to how flexible consumers will be. Um, I think on, on one side, uh, people are saying, well, they're not going to be flexible at all. Why would they? Why would they care? And they're just going to be a huge burden on the, on the system and, and, and cause uh, distribution networks in particular no end of, of, of headaches. And then on the other side, there they go. You know, the, the silver bullet. They'll be ultimately flexible. You'll have all of these traveling storage facilities uh, in, in EVs. I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Um, and we're actually about to launch a, a nifty new project with Octopus Energy over here that's that's looking at trying to to figure out exactly how consumer flex will show up on the system. But ultimately, it needs to be automated. And as, as Andy said, the consumer propositions need to be there to facilitate that, take you know any kind of active decision making away from them and just um, just enable it to happen um, at, at, at no kind of um, reduction in comfort or um, quality of life for consumers, huge supply chain um, opportunities there, I think. Great. Thanks, Kian. And John, same question, lastly, for you. And short answer, I don't think any, I don't think you can pick one or two sectors that will dominate. I agree with everything Andy and Kian have said. I think there is so much we need to do, be it from floating offshore wind turbines through to uh, what Keen just mentioned around customers. Um, there is so much we need to do across every aspect of the energy value chain. And that creates no shortage of opportunities for innovators, for companies who think they can make a difference in that area. Great. Thanks, John. Um, look, some, some really interesting um, thoughts there to finish up on. Um, it wasn't a, an easy question by any means, but I think you know, key takeaways, um, notwithstanding John, your your uh, view that you can't pick out one or two, but I think, you know, grid build out, heat heat pumps, district heating, smart solutions, data, um, storage storage building at the storage capacity as well, and, and and the role of the consumer. Those are kind of key takeaways that from here to 2030 that that might resonate with some of the Irish companies that are listening in. Um, I'm sure we could continue for another hour uh, talking about this topic. It's it's all encompassing really um, and integral to uh, to the UK reaching its net zero targets. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of other opportunities to 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 chat about this um, during the course of our net zero UK campaign. Um, but for today, I think 
that's all we have time for. Um, if you sent a question and we didn't manage to cover it, um, we'll be sure to follow up with you directly afterwards. Um, on behalf of Enterprise Ireland, I'd just like to thank today's panelists for their time. So, Kean, John, Andy, thank you very much for your, your time and your input. Um, it's greatly appreciated. Um, just to say as well, a recording of today's sessions will be made available via email to all attendees shortly and will be shared across uh, Enterprise Ireland's communications channels as well. So, please keep an eye out for that and, and do feel free to share with any relevant colleagues or, or contacts you think might be interested. Um, please do also keep an eye out for future um, and further. EIUK Net Zero Energy Sector Insights, uh, including events and reports that um, will hopefully help keep you up to speed on, on the pace of change here in the UK and, and hopefully help you to understand the implications for your, for your business. Um, if you want further information, market assistance, or have any follow-up questions, uh, please don't, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. My details are on the screen. Um, but for now, um, other than that, the only thing left to say is thank you for taking the time to join uh, the session today. Have a good evening and uh, hope to speak again soon, uh, hopefully in person next time. So thanks everyone and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye.